Mr. Joy. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Elmsley. Thank you. Glad to have you this morning. Thank you for inviting me. What a journey it has been for you. It has. And one of the things that I guess we can start on, a note we can start on, is this whole thing of church can become for so many people just a, just a, a thing we go through. And I wonder if in your own experience, if there was a time, you know, like so many Caymanians, when as a child, you, you went to church. I did. I did. I, I actually grew up in a church um, in, in Northside. You know, I want to make sure that what is said here today is, is um, certainly coming from the Holy Spirit, certainly being spoken and what God wants people to hear. So if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to pray first. Sure. If we can. Oh, gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, I know, oh Lord, that you have sanctified me, Father. I ask, oh Father, that you bid me come before the throne of grace, oh Lord, that I can, oh Father, petition you for a blessing upon me, oh Lord, a blessing upon this congregation, Father. I ask, Lord, that you please, Father, decrease me and make me nothing, Father, that only you, O oh Father, will be in me, O oh Lord, that you will increase yourself within me. I ask, Father, that today everything that is said by me in all my words and all my actions, O oh Father, that the people listening and the people receiving this, Father, will only see, will only hear of your grace and mercy and love, Father. Yes. Let them not even remember me, Father. Let me not even be a part of their memory when they leave here, Father. Let them only remember to glorify your name, Father. Yes. Let them lift you up on high, O oh Father. Let them speak of the grace and mercy that you showed to one sinner, O oh Father. Yes. Let it be that way, Father. Direct each and every one, Father, that does not know your Son, Jesus Christ, to the cross, O oh Father. Let them come to know the blood that was shed for the sins of the world, Father. Yes. Let the words that you speak through me today, Father, mm -hmm. be words that you will lead to draw, use to draw people closer to you to reconcile them, that your elect can stand fast, O oh Father, sanctified in the rock and faith in Jesus Christ, Father. As you came for me, Father, I ask that you use me as you will, Father. My life is yours. I have surrendered to you, Lord. Use me as you will, O oh Father. Let them not remember me, Lord. Let them remember the grace. Let them remember the mercy. Let them remember the love, Father. Let them glorify your name, O oh Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So yeah, I grew up in I grew up in Northside. In fact, my father was was a preacher. He was uh, he was a preacher of the Pilgrim Holiness Church. And at my birth, he lost his church. He lost his wife. He lost his two daughters. So I grew up in a district that was small, and and the church embraced me. And it was it was hard because I started out life really with two things against me. One, I was the son of a Jamaican. Two. I, um, I was the son of a pastor who lost his church. And so I began life really uh, in controversy. And then I lived the life of controversy, great controversy. I, I, um, but the women of the district embraced me. They, they, they poured love into me in every encounter. Uh, nothing from my past, even, even those instances, qualifies or, or makes it okay for the things that I did. Certainly, I make no excuses for those. And I don't believe that there's anything in my past that cannot be used today to glorify God in some way. That, uh, that it's clear that God has a purpose for all of us. And I, I am very fortunate to be. I wonder if you, encountered. If, if you would describe some of that, that life before Christ. I mean. Oh, my, I, I think without a doubt, I, um, God came into my life on. December the 12th of 2013, and um, I've been reading this book ever since. I, I guess the least amount of time I put in on a daily basis is about nine hours, and I've come to know God here. I didn't try to memorize scripture. I think that, that um, God is more than capable to direct me. So prior to that, I, uh, I know that this is the infallible word of God. I know that this is the truth. I know that this is the word of God written by God using the hands of men. And I can tell you that's the only reason why I do not say that I am the most wicked man 
to ever live in the history of the world because Paul said he was and the Bible says he was. And so I can't claim that. But prior to God, I was a very evil man and wicked man. I, uh, you know, since I've been out of prison, I've, I've uh, began, people have began to reach out to me and people from my past who've said that they used to work with me and they used to be afraid of me. I know them. Members of my family used to be afraid of me. Mm. Um, so I was, I was a very wicked man. And, um, you know, even my encounter with God was one of, one of wickedness and um, final surrender. Mm -hmm. It's rough. <laughs> t t tell me a little about that encounter. I mean, the, 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 the conversion experience. You're, you're, talk, you're talking about Paul's description of himself. Yes. And so in so many ways, in the same, in the way that, that God had to just kind of hit him down and stop him. Yes. It sounds like you had a similar kind of conversion experience. Describe it for us. I, I did. I, I, in fact, was, you saw the clip. I actually have never seen that. That's the first time I've seen that. Um, I don't watch the news or anything anymore. But I was at home and um, I was alone planning. And I got a call on, on December the 11th. May have been about 7 p.m. And it was from a family member who's also a junior pastor in one of the churches. And, you know, he called me up and he said he just wanted to, to talk and he wanted to invite me to lunch. He didn't, he didn't bring up Christ. He didn't bring up the church. He didn't bring up religion. He just really wanted to go to lunch and get caught up. And he and I hadn't spoken in about two years. Um, and I said, okay. And I, immediately as I hung up, the, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon me. And I, in fact, I don't know what, at that time I didn't know what it was, but I began to cry. But I knew it was God. And so I looked up and I said, you need to stay away from me because I'm going to finish what I've started. And I said, you get away from me. Leave me alone. And I used my hand and pushed him away and went inside and uh, you know, I went to bed, woke up the next morning, stayed in bed, waiting for my wife and children to leave, got up, did as the clip said, you know, I went got coffee, had a cigarette, stepped outside the front door. And I remember lighting the cigarette, I remember taking a drone outing and then I remember being inside, prostrating, staring at the front door and Christ was right there and begging for forgiveness. And um, you know, it, it was it was an experience where I got forgiveness and I knew I had it. And immediately knowing I had it, I became fearful that I was going to lose it. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I said, you know, I was still saying, I know that you're Lord, I know that you're Jesus Christ, I know that you died for me and I, I need to be forgiven, I can't live like this anymore. And, you know, he said, you're forgiven, you know, he said, it's done. And, and I said, what about the drugs? You know, I can't stop. And he said, it's done. And I said, what about alcohol? I can't stop. He said, it's done. And I said, what about the cigarette smoking? I can't stop. He said, it's done. And I said, what about the profanity? I can't stop. He said, it's done. And those things just went. And, uh, you know, I went to prison and, and it's constantly around you. Never once thought about it. And there's a difference because yeah, yeah, I need to be clear that I never wanted to give up those things. God took those things from me. You know, I didn't work. I didn't do make any efforts. All grace from Christ, really. I mean, I didn't even go to church. I couldn't even make it to church. I was so far gone and sinner. You know, mm. I couldn't come here. I, um, so Christ had to come and get me. He had to come to my house and get me. Mm. And that's pure grace. I, I did nothing, nothing to deserve this. Uh, grace that I've gotten is, is uh, something I try and share with people every day. Mm. And the grace has been constant because every time I try and do something to try and take credit for it, I fall a little bit and Christ is right there with more grace, you know. And sometimes, you know, the journey has been where I was at home for the first four months prior to going to prison and, and Christ had me in this book. And I'm telling you, it's, it's, he was right here at the right hand every single morning. He'd get me up at midnight. Sometimes it would be from midnight until 7 p.m. Sometimes it was from 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. And it was all day. And uh, the experiences I had with Christ were, were uh, things that, help to transform and I'm still being transformed. Mm -hmm. Because he, he also chastised me. They were very painful days, you know, very, very, I paid the price, man, I paid the price. Mm -hmm. And the conversion, and I guess to some extent it was the flash fighting against the spirit, but they were extremely painful. I mean, there were, there were days that 
I, um, I literally said to him, you know, it would be better if you just kill me because this hurts so bad. Mm -hmm. There were days when I had periods of for weeks where I remembered the sins of my past and they were so painful that I had to pray and say, please don't make me remember them all at one time. Just give me one at a time because it'll kill me if you do. And I would lean against the wall and just cry and cry myself to sleep like a little boy and then just go and lie down and go to sleep and it, it was it was that bad and then there were you know there were other things like visions and um, you know Christ controlling my life <laughs> one 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 in particular I began to get stronger spiritually and very quickly and um, I began to write every day write write constantly and um, I began to exercise as well so I began to go to Beach Bay which is just down the street for me and walk and get exercise and praise God out loud and, you know, I had visions while walking where I watched the Holy Spirit just crawl into me on a, on a flat screen TV. It's just there. And I watch it happen. And I also, in getting stronger, thought I could have sufficient faith and convince God not to send me to, to prison. So one day I was, I was going out and I said, you know, I think we've got this thing settled and I'm not going to go to jail. And if it was the first van, first vehicle I see at the top of the road when I get out would be the Northwood prison van. So I get to the top of the road and the first van I see is the Northwood prison van. So God was saying to me, you're going to go to jail, you know. And he didn't, he didn't do anything. He's never done anything to me that he didn't give me prior warning of. And he ensured that I was strong enough and had sufficient grace to make it true. I mean, I, I continue to pray through the court case. The, um, you know, when, he, when, when God first said to me that I had to plead guilty. Um, I tried to negotiate my way out. And um, I offered to just sit in court and say nothing. Let them find me guilty. But I had done everything in my previous life to make, to be the victim. And uh, I needed to take a stand as a man of God, as a new person in Christ. But the truth, the truth was I did those things. In fact, I did some other things that I also confessed to that that um, you know, God, I, let me confess to some stuff to the commissioner of police that I said, you know what's going to happen, right? You know, this is going to end my family. You know, you're going to get more charges and you're making me do these things. And I prayed and said, please, I can't handle any more charges. There's 32, you know, I can't take them. And uh, the commissioner of police, after I confessed, wrote me an email. He didn't say it. He sent an email saying no more. It, it's over. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, that's grace too. No, but, no, I wonder, Joe, as you're talking there, you know, some people are saying, well, you look like you look, you look like you've gone, gone over the deep end. You kind of, yeah. you know, you, you, you've gone a little crazy or what? You know, um, to have come to that point where you, you felt led to confess and you're describing all these, these kinds of experiences in your worship with God and so on. And people are saying, you know, Joe is just doing this because he wants to get off. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's just part of his of his ploy. You know, he's a, he's a smart man, mm -hmm. kind of thing, and he's trying to outsmart the law. And some people are saying, well, you know, this conversion thing is just another hoax, it's just another a thing. You know, wh what 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 have you seen in your life and in your experience since that conversion that makes you know this is genuine, this is a different joy? It's it's um. You know, when, when someone is an addict, they think of nothing else. And that, that's, that's how it was for me. That's how it was is for addicts. It doesn't matter what the addiction is. It could be drugs like me. It could be food. It could be sex. It could be shoes, whatever. That's what they think of. And when, when Christ came into my life and took that away from me, I haven't had thoughts of that. And the, the, it's important that people understand that that's what repentance is too, you know. It is being repulsed by the sins of the world. Yes. You don't just not want to do them, you hate them, you, you become repulsed by it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I couldn't do, I couldn't stop for myself, you know. I, I don't have any problems with talking about my past. You know, God has said, it's removed them from me as far as the east is from the west, and that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, I don't have any problems facing the one. People who say that, or that, you know, I think people need to be careful what they say. One of the things that God has taught me is that, you know, and, and maybe it's unique to me because my mouth was so big and because I caused so much harm with it, that he's taught me that 
things you say have power. Yep. You know, you need to be careful what comes up. So some people have said that I'm, I'm pretending, which is okay. I, I pray for those people. I've added them to my prayers, you know. As a Christian, I can't hate nobody, man. I, I can't hold it. I understand that. And, you know, I take it as a compliment, too, because no one during the time of Christ believed he was who he was. Mm. So they denied him, too. So you want to deny me, that's okay. I, that means that I'm mirroring him even more, and I, I, I like that. Mm. You know, I want, when I come before Christ, that he looks at me. He says, you know, Joseph, it's hard to tell the difference between me and you. Mm. And I want to be able to say, all by grace, Lord. All by grace. Mm -hmm. No works for me. All by grace. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm okay. And you know, the other thing that some people may say is that uh, I'm using God. No human being can use God. No one can use God. God is supreme. And you know, it's hard for evil people to stand up publicly and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay. And I can tell you that Jesus Christ is Lord. I can tell you that Christ came and got me. Christ came and got me when I wasn't able to get to church. Mm -hmm. Okay, he came and got me. And I've, I've often questioned, in fact, what I said at the last church that I spoke that was, I couldn't figure out whether Christ came and got me because he loved the people of the Cayman Islands or he loved me. And <laughs> he wanted to stop me from doing what I was planning. And, and you know, he answered after the last time he came to me and he said, you know, it was, it was all you because I could have just let you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And the people of the Cayman Islands would have been saved. Right. But he allowed me enough to come and get me. And, uh, you know, Christians and people, we, we have to understand. Look, I can tell you that I have done absolutely nothing, nothing to be saved by grace. Christ did it all for me, everything. No, when, no, did, did, did some of that change show itself in your time of incarceration? Oh, man, I, I, uh, I think the first night that I went to church in prison, I actually said it was so good to be in jail. I mean, I was pumped so full of the Holy Spirit and so happy that I could care less where you put me. I, I even told them when they were checking me in, look, guy, you won't put me in a 50 foot hole. You give me my Bible, I'm going to be fine. I was just that happy, you know, that happy. And, you know, I, I still thought that I could negotiate with God through faith. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I believed and begged and prayed and believed that I would not be sent to prison. And then when I was... When I was sentenced, I, uh, I went back to prison. I'm arguing with God in my head and saying, you know, this is unfair. I did everything you said. <laughs> you know, I went public. I've sacrificed my whole life. I've given it all up. I had put so much effort into tricking the public, and I've given all that up. And, uh, you know, here I am. You're sending me to prison. And this is over. You know, you're being unfair. You're not treating me right. And I'm going to go and find as much weed as I can find to smoke and spend this two years staying high. And inmate walks over to me and he says, Mr. Joey, God just asked me to come and ask you to pray for me. And I said, no, man, he's just asking me to give you grace so he can give me grace. <laughs> and my journey with Christ has been that. He's always found a way to give me grace because as a man, I'm not capable of anything but sin. Nothing but sin. I'm torn in sin and raised in wickedness and my nature is one of sinfulness so for me to survive and stay out of sin i have to every single day acknowledge that jesus christ is lord and that he i'm sanctified i have to spend time in this this book the day that i stopped reading this book i've begun to backslide it doesn't take sin to do that you know and you know i enjoy it i i really do enjoy it no what what happened in in the family i mean did, did things change in in your family because because of yeah. course your, your family knows you're the best they, they see the good good and the bad sides of you they experience the the, the wickedness that you yes. describe i'm sure um did anything change there yeah a lot actually because when 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 i was first saved i was um i have two small children my children are, spread out two small children that watch god transform me before their eyes so they got to come home from school every evening and saw the different man i mean i i in the early days i couldn't even speak this loud when initially the first two months my voice was so soft even when i tried to raise it i couldn't raise it it was just so gentle and so soft and you know my children were conditioned to debate to argue on everything, argue about taking out the garbage, argue about washing dishes. Even if you were wrong, you argue. If you were right, you argue. <laughs> and so they had to get accustomed to 
to me because when they said no, I wouldn't fight anymore. I just wouldn't do it. And I spent a lot of time, um, you know, loving them because I hadn't seen them really. I hadn't seen them. You know, I had these two little children I hadn't really seen. And I began to, to see them for the first time and to thank God for them. And those two little children is the reason, is who God used to actually keep my family because uh, when, when I told my wife, when God told me I had to go tell my wife, you know, I didn't want to do that. I, um, I tried resisting and I, the, the pain was so intense that I had to, four times I went to this woman to tell her, couldn't do it. And to, I kept, tell her, to tell her what? To tell her that I was guilty, okay. you know, and that I had to go and plead guilty. And each time I turned and walked away, the pain got more and more. And it's pain, severe pain, until I, I said it, and then there's peace. And when it was all said and done, the only two people that I know about on this planet that wanted anything to do with me was those two little children. And those two little children cried for me. Those two little children let everybody know that they loved me. Those two little children insisted that they come and visit me in prison to do that their mother had to bring them by their mother bringing them she got she got to meet the new man that god was transforming and she actually fell in love with this man um, you know she and i had this conversation last night she brought it up i think here now and then she looks and pinches herself and says, this is real <laughs> and and says you know i used to hate you man i used to like yeah i used to hate me too you know i used to i used to live in here and that's what sin does for you you know yeah, preachers saying over and over that sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to do, to stay and make you do things that you don't do. It's, it also took me to a point where I couldn't look at the man in the mirror. I couldn't get up in the morning and shave and look at the man. I had to shave my eyes down because I had to brush my teeth with my eyes down because I just couldn't look at the man in the mirror. And uh, you know, sin will do that. My past, there is nothing about that has happened to me over the last 20 months, from December the 13th to now that I regret. Nothing has been wrong because Christ doesn't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I needed to go to jail. I got, I got far more than I deserve. I got more than I deserve. And grace is abounding within me every day. Mm -hmm. Look, three months ago, I was in prison. A month ago, I was unemployed. This week, I'm looking to hire six people. That's grace. You know, that's, that's grace. It's, it's, um, and I didn't make any effort either. I told God, look, I can't go and look at a job because I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to mess it up. So why don't I just sit here, watch TV, and when you work it out, you let me know. And, and, uh, and I did that. I stayed home, and I, I asked God, you know, God spoke to my heart and said, look, you need to spend time with these children. And I got to spend time with my two little children. Uh, they were home on vacation, start back school on Monday, and I started work last week. And, you know, I didn't try. I got, up, I got up one morning during my daily devotional and I, I um, got an email from a local businessman. He said, look, sent the email saying, I, I understand you're out. Do you need some work? And I responded and said, yeah, I do. <laughs> and then I wrote my devotional and he, he responded and said, you know, um, he's off island, be back in a week and he'll call and, and we'll meet. So I said, okay, wrote my devotional and I, you know, I thank God. And um, then my phone rang and another guy called and he said, you know, I heard you're out. Do you need some work? I said, yeah. Can I start tomorrow? And he said, yes, you can. So I said, okay. And then I spent the day saying, wow, God, you're really working now. Blessings are here. I'm out of the wilderness. I'm in the promised land. You know, I'm going to really enjoy this now. And then by 6 or 7 o'clock that evening, my phone rang and I got another job off. I got three job offers in one day. And... Um, you know, when I was before the parole board, there's a girl out there who said, when I told her I intended to work, she said, really, you? <laughs> Who's going to hire you? You know how hard it is out there? Mm. So by 8 o'clock that night, I was saying, God, you need to let her know I got a job. And <laughs> fuck up. Three. Look, the old joy is dead and gone, you know. Let him stay dead. Let him stay dead. Mm. This, this new, fact, my church that I go to, um, Chapel Church of God, they, mm. you know, for... For people, for inmates, ex-cons like me who come out in this small society. You know, it's not easy even being embraced. And uh, there's nothing Christian about that. There's nothing Christian about it in a church that turns innocent away. Because that's what we're here for. Yes. And, uh, you know, that church really embraced me. I, I got invited 
I went. I sat in the back because I really didn't want to to uh, to be offended anymore, you know. So I sat in the back, and first day, Pastor Allison invited me to the front, and I said, no, that's okay, I'll sit here. And then I went back that night to church service, and he had me close the service in prayer. And he, he did something that just blew me away that I knew it was God showing me that the first church that rejected me didn't really reject me. He was moving me, and um, I was where I needed to be. And he, because he placed his arm around me, he held the mic, and he said, you know, he introduced me as someone who God had done miraculous works, of, and he made me feel great. And the next the Monday morning, he asked me to give my testimony the next Sunday. And, and the church, what the church did was the church changed my name. You know, they, the pastors got up on the platform, saying, we're not going to call you Joey, we're going to call you Joseph, because Joey was a guy in sin, and Joseph is the man that God has given us. Amen. And that church loves me, you know. And, and um, God has taken me there, and I have a place to go and worship God. And that's all I really wanted. So, Joseph. <laughs> yeah. there, there, there are probably people here this morning, sort of on the brink, thinking about commitment to Christ, probably thinking to themselves, the sin that I am in, I can't change. Um, or probably, you know, have been to church from, for a long, long time, just going through the motions, but have never really made a commitment to Christ. I want you to, I want you to speak to those people. What, 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 what would you say yeah. to those people who I, might be here this morning? I tell you, I can remember being in prison, and a prison officer was, came to me, and he was really down, really, really down, and it was Christmas time, he's a foreigner. He was just having a bad day. And he was very negative, you know. So I began to talk to him and you know, he said, life was so hard. I said, really? He said, let me show you something. I, ha I had access at the time to a computer on the internet. And so I Googled Joey Ebanks came on. And I said, look at the number of hits. Was, I think it was six to 7,000 and something. And I said, every one of those are negative. There is nowhere on this planet that I can go that people will Google me and not see my story. And I'm telling you, God has made a way for me. God makes a way for you. Amen. You have not committed any sin that someone else has, committed, has not committed. You know, don't, don't let Satan trick and fool you. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to try everything to keep you. You know, don't make the mistake of thinking that Satan is out in the bars or on the street and with the drugs. He's right here, right now, right? This is the people he wants to convert. This is the people he wants to pull back. But so is Christ, and Christ has beaten him. And, you know, one of the great things about this book is the fact that God makes it clear in here that Satan has been defeated. Amen. He outlines clearly what's going to happen at the end time, and Satan can't do anything about that. Yo, this, this relationship with God is not one of works. It's just faith and f accepting that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. He died for your sins too. He died for mine. You know, I'm telling you that my story should, should be clear to everyone that there is no sin you can commit that you can't get forgiveness for. The one sin that this Bible speaks about is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And I believe that to be rejecting the conviction when he directs you to the cross of Christ. And that's the blasphemy when you reject the Holy Spirit. And Christ was calling me for 50 years, you know, chasing me for 50 years, and now I'm chasing him. And he's running to me too. So I tell you, you, you need to accept this fact. One, there is nothing from my sinful past that I miss. You know, one of the things people talk to me about is politics. Mm -hmm. and, and I make it clear. I don't even want to be in a room with them. Really, I, I don't. There's nothing I miss about that. Nothing. I want, if, I, if God was to come to me and say to me, okay, Joseph, I'm going to give you one wish. What is it going to be? It would be that he let me work with inmates to direct them to the cross. That's it. I don't want to be involved with any of that anymore. I want to be able to help inmates find Christ. That's what I want to do. And I don't want to be remembered either. I want to get to heaven. And when I get to heaven, I want people to come up to me and say, there was something you said. There was one time you spoke. There was one time I saw you. You said this, and I found Christ because of that. I want to be credited in heaven for what I did. Just like I want to thank people that got me there and kept me there. You know? For those who, for those who may be struggling, your 
your back and forth. There's only one thing that is going to help you, and that's this book. I get up. I go to bed at 8 o'clock every night. Not because, and, I, and I've been doing this from before I went to prison because the days were so long and so hard for me that I just got accustomed to going to bed at 8. And I try, I tried last night to step until 8.30 and it was really hard. So I go to bed. You know. <laughs> There's nothing on TV that I want to watch, really. I'm not going to subject my soul to profanity on TV. I'm not going to do that. I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to watch the news that tells me how bad everything is and everything is in such dire need that shows dead bodies on the streets, conditions me to not love my, I'm not going back here, I'm not going back here. So I go to bed at eight, I get up sometimes at two o'clock in the morning and, uh, and I do my devotionals and I spend time, God gives me the scriptures to read, he teaches them to me, I write, I send out emails, you're included in those emails, so I, I share and people also think that I share because I want to prove that I'm Save, but I'm not. I'm evangelizing. I'm spreading the good news because you're going to go through the days, you know, and you're going to have a hard time. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, like Deb has shared with us, there's scripture that you're going to need to hold on to. And one of some of the stuff that got me through prison was the fact that Romans chapter 8, verse 1 tells me there's no more condemnation for me. I've been forgiven. That I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You know, that. You know, Christ died for me. God loved me so much, he gave his son for me. Yeah. And the only way for us to stay steadfast in the rock is to read this book. And you've got to read this book. And you've got, don't read this to try and memorize scripture so you can look good in public. Memorize, read it so you can get to know God, discover God and who he is and what he wants to do. For you. Yeah. Every day I fill up on this. I understand the difference between the flesh and the spirit today. And I fill up on the word. And God teaches it to me, gives me enough strength that I can, you know, go out in public and I can f deal with the day. And Christ walks before me, you know, I have faith that Christ is going before me, certainly in my heart. The Holy Spirit is within me, sanctifying me. And he comes behind me too, you know, just in case there's anyone there. Mm -hmm. You know, God also shows as we grow just how far he's brought us. In. And I was sharing with the pastor when we had lunch last week, one, one instance of just how far God has brought me. I, um, I went and knocked on the door and the guy who opened it insulted me and he insulted me in front of a whole bunch of people. He called me by name and he insulted me too. And um, I turned around and walked back to my car and sat inside and when I had gotten inside, I said, wow, oh, that guy just insulted me. You know, it took me a while. Three years ago, he would not have done that to the old Joey, you know. But God doesn't even make me see it anymore. You know, and I had to do what I had to do, which was to immediately pray for him. And even throughout the day, it kept coming back and Satan kept trying to say to me, you know, you need to deal with this guy, you need to deal with this guy. So I dealt with him. And I dealt with him the only way I know to do that today, and that's to pray for him and to keep praying for him. Mm -hmm. Because God tells me that if I love him, he's going to teach me how to love my, even my enemies. Mm -hmm. You know, if I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, I can't help but love my enemies. Now, here's the thing. The great thing is that I can intercede today for my enemies. People who don't like me, I can pray for. And, you know, Christ takes those prayers and finesses them and passes them on to our Heavenly Father. They begin to do a work in the individual's life. And if I can get that individual to the place that I am with Christ, he's no longer my enemy. Amen. And that has to be the objective, you know, of every Christian, to pray for sinners. You have to pray for him. You know how many prayers must have went up to get me, to get Christ to come to my house and get me? That's what I was wondering too. They must have been a <laughs> lot of praying, you know. When I was in sin, I would walk around and women would say, okay, man, and women would say to me, you know, we're praying for you. Yes. We're praying for you. Yes. And I would say, okay, thank you. And then you have to understand too that when you pray for someone, don't expect immediate happiness and joy. Christ took me to jail first, right, to help with my conversion. His way is not our way. And going to jail was a good thing for me too because I got to... Let me tell you what one of the great things is about it. The great thing about going to prison is that I can never look at anyone with condemnation again. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to be so humble that you're looking up at everybody and holding them in esteem. You know? It's a wonderful thing. And that I had been robbed of that by sin. And the last thing that, that, that I wanted to add was that, 
you know, for people who, who may think that I'm pretending. Mm. You know, if you do and if you're a real Christian, first of all, Christians don't think like that. But if, if you do, pray for me. Cry, I'll take all the prayers I can get mm. at any time. You know? Yes. Joseph. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's been our joy to have you with us this morning. What a difference Christ can make Absolutely. in a life. What a difference he has made in your life. And our prayer for you is that that difference will grow and intensify in such a way that that difference will make a difference Amen. in the lives of others. Amen. And I trust that it's making a difference this morning in the lives of some amongst you. I want to thank you. Thank you, Fab, for joining us. Thank you.